a couple of weeks ago, my favourite wife and I uh, went to Norfolk and spent a, a week shrouded in mist that such was the weather. But the high point of it, in a way, was going to a place called Wells Next to Sea. And we arrived on this particular morning and you could hardly see beyond the end of your nose. And so we took refuge in a cafe and I was sent to buy the drinks. Um, a decaf skinny latte for, 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 for madame. And I looked down the list of possibilities and saw the words Turkish apple tea. And thought that sounds different. So I had a Turkish apple tea. And I have to tell you, it was fantastic. It was like drinking apple crumble. <laughs> it was superb. And I can still, after a couple of weeks, remember the sensation of first drinking from it and realising I'd hit on something wonderful. It was, if you like, a wow moment. And if I go anywhere now and see Turkish apple tea, I can guarantee you, particularly as well as next to sea, I will be ordering it and sampling its joyous, joyous delights. A wow moment. And in a way, in the evolving story of the early church, in those days after the church began, this story of Philip encountering the Ethiopian eunuch is a wow moment. Here is this really wealthy man. He's riding in a chariot and he's reading from his seemingly his own copy of the Old Testament scriptures. So he had money because in those days people didn't have that opportunity. The money wasn't there. The resources weren't available. So he is really, really important. He's a treasure to the queen. He's a man of profound and significant influence. And Philip runs alongside him. And there is this conversation, this encounter that culminates in the Ethiopian being baptised. And so in a way it provides a framework for us to talk about what we've shared this morning and to think about the nature of the community, the church, into which Isla has been baptised and therefore hopefully in that to see something of what it means to be a people who are seeking God, a people who are trying to follow Jesus uh, and what that means to all of our lives as we journey forward. And I want to say three things about this encounter and what it says about us and what it says about the people of the church. The first thing it speaks about is our imperfection. The Bible is really a very difficult book to handle. If you start reading at the beginning in Genesis, you'll probably get through Genesis and Exodus, then you'll get into Leviticus and Numbers, which is a bit like walking through a bog. It's such heavy going that you're likely, in a sense, to give up and put it aside. It's not an easy book to deal with. Better, in a sense, to start with the Gospels in the New Testament and the stories there of Jesus. But it's a really important book because, in a sense, it speaks about God's relationship with humanity. And it paints a picture of the holiness of God. The one who we're invited to come before and it contrasts that with the reality of humanity and the fact that if we're honest, we recognise our imperfections. The church often describes itself as being a school for sinners because this great epic story speaks of something of who we are. In the Old Testament, the books of the law, which was the, the rules and regulations that Jews were invited to follow, had become a burden around their necks, had become something quite complicated, complex and difficult. And the Ethiopian, sitting in his chariot, reading aloud as was a custom of the day, comes across some words from the prophecy of Isaiah, one of the most important books in the Old Testament, because it often speaks of the Messiah, the promised one of God, who was going to come at some point in the future. And that's really where the eunuch found himself as he read this passage that talked about this suffering servant who was going to come and make things different. And so this imperfect community of the church, in a way, looks at that difference revealed in our Saviour Jesus Christ, who came and gave of himself to overcome the law, to set us free, and to give us a chance to know his love, to live his life, and to contemplate the joys of eternity. 
This baptism in which we have shared this morning symbolised in a sense our journey from our imperfection through living waters to coming out being different. This place where we who recognise our frailties can come and receive the blessing of forgiveness and become new once more. John Wesley, who was the founding father of Methodism, talked of his experience in the May of 1738, the 24th of May, when he was at a gathering, and in that moment, he, he described it as feeling his heart strangely worn, when suddenly he realised, in a sense, that God is holy and loving, not austere and separate, holy and loving, and that he, John Wesley, in spite of his weakness, his frailty, his sin could be in relationship with this God. It transformed his life. It transformed our country. And we who recognise our imperfections still dare to share some of that message here today and invite the world to see its frailty and to see its need of God. The second thing this passage talks about is how the people of God need to be seekers. Even for those of us who are familiar with going to church, going to a new church is a bit of a challenge because you walk through the door and you don't really know what's going to happen. When you have to stand up, when you sit down. Whether there will be a book to follow, whether there will be words on a screen, whether you'll be greeted warmly or ignored as you walk in through the door. Church is a challenging place. And if you add into that the layers of the, the history where the church has got it wrong, the fact that the people of the church often get it wrong, then you see something of the challenge that's presented. But we come here because we are seekers. The Ethiopian eunuch does something really, really important. He's reading this thing that he cannot understand. And it would have been too easy to go on, to put it aside and ignore what was going on. But instead he says to Philip, who's going to explain this to me? I want to understand what's written here, but my brain can't do it. And Philip begins with that passage and explains the good news of Jesus. The church is here for those who want to know more of God and of his love revealed in Jesus Christ. It's not here as a group who think they have arrived, who they know all the answers, who understand it all perfectly. We are here as a community who are seeking to know and understand more and discover something of the reality of the love that we've seen celebrated here in this baptism this morning. It's a place where we can come to ask questions. Now, you can interrupt the sermon if you like, but that's not normal. It's a place we come to ask questions, a place to think, to reflect, to share, and to become. To see something of the elusive reality of God and discover something of his touch upon our lives. In my previous life, I used to be a school teacher, which is a joyous occupation. And faced with a class of kids, you will all have sat in classes like this, the, the, the room normally divided into two. Those who, in a sense, who wanted to do your particular subject and those who didn't. And it was those that did that were the joy because when they were wanting to learn, to discover, to grow, it made life far more exciting than confronted by a group who weren't interested and didn't want anything to do with whatever it was that you were trying to teach them. The church is called to be a learning community, seeking to discover more in our weaknesses to see how God's strength and wisdom allows us to discover more. So in the hope that like the Ethiopian eunuch, things become clearer. We understand and the journey progresses. 
And then thirdly, the church is called to be a community who strive. Our daughter is fast approaching 21. And I suppose it's an opportunity for us to look back and think about how she has evolved and developed. To see those things in the sense that she has inherited. She's inherited her mother's looks, which I'm sure she's very grateful. She's inherited my character, which she might not be too grateful for, but that's part of who she is. But it's all those other things in the sense that she has become, and her brother has as well, I suppose, where we look and in a sense can assess how effective we have been as parents and I suppose when Fran and Ben get older and maybe have children of their own and seek to bring them up, they will look back on the example that we have given them and probably wreak havoc in the lives of any potential grandchildren. Striving. You strive as a parent, as I'm sure Chloe and Anthony will do, to give their children the best possible start. As the church we are called to strive as the Ethiopian eunuch in his own way was striving and to strive towards two things to become more aware of God and to become more like Jesus just imagine travelling from Ethiopia to Jerusalem in a chariot the eunuch had set off on a difficult, dangerous, and I suspect extremely uncomfortable journey because he wanted to go to Jerusalem, the centre of worship for the Jews, and to worship there, to discover something of, a, of God in the liturgy and experience of the temple. It was really important for him to do. And then on his journey back, as he's reading through the scroll, he wants Philip to explore with him what it's all about. He wants to know more. And Philip explains it to him. And that asks us questions about whether we have the audacity to want to know more about the God who brought this world to be and what his role could be in our lives. And then to become more like Jesus. I was reading this week about how in the Celtic tradition in, in this country, uh, uh, way back in the sort of 5th, 6th, 7th century AD, when Christianity was a, in a very precarious state in a way because most of the country wasn't Christian, uh, and the way in which the early followers of Jesus sought to live in a way that showed themselves to be different. So one of the things they would do is they, when they went out of the house, they would put a pebble in their mouths. And the reason they'd put the pebble in their mouths would be to stop them talking too much. Through fear of saying the wrong thing. Through fear of gossiping. Through fear of getting it wrong. That the pebble was there designed to make them think before they spoke. The church is here seeking to be like Jesus and embody the way of love. Embody the reality that Jesus calls us to. To find those qualities of peace, joy and love that Jesus offers and to seek to show the world that there is something better than what's happening out there that the rise of individualism, of nations being inclined to go to war, all these things are not right. And the church is here striving to be different. Sometimes succeeding, other times really struggling, but striving to be different, to offer a voice that says it doesn't have to be like this. Things can be better. So here we are. We've baptised Isla this morning. And the question for all of us, whether we are of the church or whether we're not, is what difference does sharing in this event make to us? We've had a picture painted of God's willingness in love to receive us and hold us close. Here, 
we have been reminded that the church is imperfect. And it has a mission to seek and to strive to be different, to discover more about the God who brought each one of us to be. Long ago, a Jewish king called David wrote some words when he tried to explore something of the reality of God's journey with him and to paint a picture of God as a shepherd, supporting, protecting, comforting, and providing. What's our picture of God? What's our picture of the church? And can we see and appreciate that this imperfect community that strives to be like Jesus, that seeks to discover more, offers us a model for life, life in all its fullness, and invites each one of us to consider little Isla here and what we want for her future. how we would like her to become and to ask ourselves what would she see in us? What's our bedrock? What's our morality? Where is love? For surely our hope is that Isla's life will be one of rich blessing for her and for all who encounter her. And we can now ask of ourselves, how can we play a part in that and give this beautiful little girl an opportunity to see what life really is, an opportunity to understand what love really is. And hopefully in the midst of all that, to know the God who loves her, the Christ who gave himself for her, and the Spirit of God which offers to empower us. Amen.